Thank you for joining me for episode 2042. We will have Harry Dent back with us today in just a few minutes. I really enjoyed and want to thank you for some of your pithy, snarky, and very intelligent comments about our last interview with Harry Dent. They were great. I love reading your comments, so please make more comments. They're excellent. And if you like the show, please like it as well and subscribe. Also, any reviews for the podcast version on iTunes or Spotify or whatever platform, feel free to do that as well. We love to hear your feedback, and we do use that feedback to craft future episodes. So thank you for all of that. Okay, before we get with our guest returning, Harry Dent, I want to talk to you about housing inventory. It has increased quite a bit, actually. This is a pretty decent size increase. So if you are watching on video, you can see that we now have 496,000 houses for sale in the United States of America. That is quite a bit higher than it was just a few weeks ago where we had about 465,000 homes for sale. Certainly, we would attribute this to housing affordability, which is the lowest it's been in 37 years. That means all of the would-be home buyers out there that would like to buy their first home, guess what? Their choice now is to stay in the renter pool or capitulate and compromise and decide that they will still buy a home, but they're just going to buy a lesser home. This is what, again, it seems so obvious, but most people just don't understand it. When you watch all of these other talking heads out there, you read the articles, they just don't get it. That when affordability changes, the buyer changes. <laughs> I don't know why that's so hard to understand. They, they view it as though it's one stagnant linear thing. And it's, it's just not, that's not the way the dynamics of the market work. I've been doing this for decades. I get it. I understand it. You get it because you listen to the show, but most people don't get it. They just don't understand that simple idea that that buyer changes. Okay. So if you're looking at the chart, you see the inventory standing at 496,000 homes higher than before. No question about it. That will make for a lot of clickbait, misleading headlines, a lot of doom and gloom, a lot of disaster scenarios. Nick Girelli will probably do a video about how inventory is skyrocketing, but that's just not true. That's fake news. That's bullshit, okay? <laughs> because when you look at the next chart, you're going to see, okay, inventory is up, no question about that, but it's still lower than it was last year at this time by a significant amount. It's about 10% lower than it was last year at this time. So inventory is down. There's less houses for sale. Oh my gosh, it must be a seller's market. The market is improving. I mean, do you see how you can spin this just like any way you want? And that is so misleading. But here's the most important thing to consider is when you look at the green arrow on the chart, Okay, this shows the delta between where we were several times in recent years in the pre-COVID era, whether it be 2018, 2017, or 2019, and you see that inventory is dramatically below any of these times. Inventory is scarce. It is less than half of what it was at some of those times. So we need more housing inventory. There is a huge housing shortage and it persists and persists and persists. It's just not enough inventory. Sellers will not sell their homes. They are refusing to sell their homes because their deal is too good. 65% of those people have a mortgage at or below 4%, a mortgage that they could qualify for on unemployment insurance. I mean, if they lose their job and they had to buy that house today with that same mortgage payment, they could literally qualify for the mortgage on unemployment. They wouldn't even have to have a job. I mean, that's, you know, based on the debt to income ratios, okay, the DTI. So that is an incredible thing. And it bodes for a lot of sustainability of this trend, even though we have seen inventory tick up a bit. But remember, people only have three choices, they can buy rent or be homeless. So when affordability is down, as it is now the lowest in 37 years, 37 years, a low in affordability. Now granted, Affordability was worse before that, okay? But these people are just forced to stay in the renter pool. So guess what? That puts upward pressure on rents. We've talked extensively before about rental statistics being very inaccurate because 
they're weighted toward institutional apartment building owners, not single family homes. Rental data for single family homes is notoriously bad. It just isn't that good. It's getting better. But what we are seeing with the single family home market is very strong rents, much different than the apartment market that is dramatically oversupplied. I mean, we talk about a housing shortage, right? But if you were in the apartment market and trying to rent new apartment units coming online as they were constructed, there is a a bit of a glut of inventory. Now that'll work itself out too. And it probably won't take very long, you know, just a couple of years. And we're probably going to see that dynamic shift pretty well. Also, I want to remind everybody that because of popular demand, we are doing a second Zoom meeting, and these are not webinars, they're Zoom meetings. So you can participate, ask questions, see all of your fellow investors there on the meeting with you. We're doing another Zoom meeting on this very special deal, 2.99% financing. Yes, really, you heard me say that right. It's not a typo. It's I'm not reading from a teleprompter. 2.99% financing offer a fantastic seller financing buy down mortgage rate. So if you want to get onto that, go to jasonhartman.com, fill out any web form and get on our mailing list. So you will be invited to these great Zoom meetings where we have special offers that we don't tell you about on the podcast or on the YouTube channel. 2.99% financing, go to jasonhartman.com, get on our list. So you'll be invited to that meeting. If you're already talking with one of our investment counselors, ask, them to invite you to that meeting and they will and that'll be next week so don't miss that special offer now i do want to say that there are some reservations and flaws to this 2.99 percent deal okay it's a pretty great deal but like anything in life you have to weigh the pros and cons and it's not perfect right nothing is perfect so we will talk about that on the Zoom meeting as well. So you get the real picture and you can make good, wise decisions. All right, so there's the inventory picture as it stands now. I wanna show you one more thing and then we'll get to Harry Dent. This is the 2023 forecast of home prices. (laughs) And you probably know what I'm gonna say. I was right again. Yes, I was. Okay, so look at all of these entities, these big name entities, the Mortgage Bankers Association, otherwise known as the MBA, Fannie Mae, Morgan Stanley, the American Enterprise Institute. I mean, look, folks, a lot of these folks have been on the show. You've heard interviews with their spokespeople, their founders, etc. right? Zillow, Wells Fargo, the criminal organization known as Wells Fargo, How many times have they been fined for screwing people? It's just just unbelievable the amount of corporate crookery that we allow in this country. Too big to fail, that's what happens, right? Goldman Sachs, how many times have they been fined for taking advantage of people and breaking the law? (laughs) It's just unbelievable. So Wells Fargo and Goldman Sachs, bad apples for sure. CoreLogic, right? So these were all their home price predictions for this year. And I'll just go through them. The MBA, said prices would be down. Fannie Mae said prices would be down by 1.5%. MBA, by the way, down 0.6%. Morgan Stanley, they said houses would go down by 4%. The American Enterprise Institute was very bearish. They said housing prices were going to collapse by 15 to 20%. Zillow said they would be down 0.7%. Wells Fargo, 5.5%. Goldman Sachs, negative 5% to negative 10%. And CoreLogic said that they would go up by just 3%. But guess what? All of these groups have revised their forecast because they listen to Jason Hartman, probably. (laughs) Just kidding. I don't know. Some of them do. I know that, but not all of them. So the MBA, the Mortgage Bankers Association says the year will be flat. They say this year, Housing prices will not go down. They will not go up. They'll just be flat. Fannie Mae says they'll go up by 3.9%. Morgan Stanley says flat. American Enterprise Institute says they're going to go up by 6%. Zillow says they're going to go up by 5.5%. Wells Fargo says they're going to go up by 2.2%. Goldman Sachs says they're going to go up by 1.8%. And CoreLogic says they're going to go up by 6.8%. Now, here's the thing to realize, folks. 
in spite of tax benefits, positive cash flow, inflation-induced debt destruction, and all of the other multidimensional benefits or forms of return on investment with income property, because it is the most historically proven asset class in the entire world, besides all of those things, it could be easy to make a false argument here. You know, one of my friends and fellow YouTubers makes this false argument all the time. I mean, he would be right if he wasn't looking at the whole picture, right? And that's why the argument doesn't hold water, okay? But here's the argument. In inflation-adjusted terms, these housing prices did not go up if inflation is higher than the appreciation rate. That is true. Nobel Prize winner and author of the Case Shiller Index, Robert Shiller, would argue the same thing. And he is also wrong because the most important thing many times is what they don't tell you. Remember, you can't hear the dogs that don't bark. And there is a giant dog barking here that they don't tell you. And that is simple leverage. All right. So if someone bought any of these properties, and they have 10% equity in the property. Either they put 10% down or they refinanced and pulled cash out and they got to a point where they had 10% equity. It could be 20% equity, whatever the number, you can just do the math. But 10% is the simplest thing because you just move a decimal point, okay? So these leveraged returns are dramatically higher. You basically multiply them all by 10. So if inflation is really bad and inflation is say 5%, for example, right? You know, 3% more than double the Fed's target rate. And of course I'm using the CPI and yada, yada. We, you know, that's a whole nother discussion. Just listen to the old episodes if you wanna know more about that. But let's just use CPI to keep it simple, okay? So say inflation is 5% and say Fannie Mae's forecast is correct and house prices appreciate by 3.9%. Well, you really lost money right? You lost 1.1% because in real dollars, it didn't appreciate. In nominal dollars, it did. But we have to view our life in real dollars. But this argument is completely false of, of my fellow YouTuber friend, because what he doesn't say is that people leverage the properties. So for example, if they had 10% equity in the property at the time, they would have a 39% appreciation rate effectively. 39%. So if inflation was 5%, then they're still ahead by 34%. This is why income property, I mean, it's just one of really six major reasons as to why income property is the most historically proven asset class in the entire world. And it's also the most tax favored asset class in America. And taxes are the largest expense in most of our lives. So you can see when you really analyze things properly, you can see that you're just way ahead, right? Say you put 20% down on the property or only had 20% equity. What matters is not what you put down, by the way. That's also false. What matters is the amount of equity you have in the property at the time the appreciation occurs. Yes, that is the right way to do the math. So say, for example, you had 20% in the property, 20% equity in the bank had 80%. So there, you know, you would still be up very, very substantially by like, what, 17%. So, you know, it's just, uh, or no, more than that. Anyway, whatever. I need another cup of coffee before I do math, complicated math here, folks. What is the square root and the uh, exponential of, you know, yada, yada. <laughs> anyway, people just don't look at this stuff correctly. That's why they just don't get it. And that's why they miss out on the opportunities. Can you imagine all the destruction and all the bad decisions made by following the chicken little doom and gloomers, the crash bros, the clickbait people on YouTube that are telling you how bad things are, how everything's going to crash. Can you imagine following these idiots for the last 10, 12 years, how much money you lost? I mean, the devastation caused by these people is absolutely insane. You know, see, the problem is nobody sues them for it, right? Because it's sort of hard to sue someone for something that didn't happen for the dog that didn't bark. Okay. I didn't invest. And so I didn't make money. And therefore I have damages, right? That would be the argument, but it's easy to do it the other way, right? I invested in this deal and I lost money. So now I'm gonna sue the guy, right? Like that's an easy case, but the other case is too speculative, right? So it's just funny the way the world works. Very few people really account 
for the devastating, tragic, disastrous losses caused by these people. Yeah, all those clickbait titles, all those doom and gloomers, all these bad predictions. I mean, look, you can't blame someone who reads a crystal ball, right? I mean, that's just impossible, right? But sound, prudent economic decisions made with proper thought, analyzing the multidimensional characteristics of income property, that's the way we have to do things. And so for that, I am glad you are listening to this show and not missing out on those opportunities. Be sure to like and subscribe and write us a review on iTunes. And without further ado, let's get to our guest today and our continuing discussion with the very bearish Harry Dent. Here we go. I'm saying, and I'll stake my career on this, the next year we'll see more weakening than people are expecting because of these lags, both lags. Okay. The 5.2 trillion stimulus will wear off as any yep. stimulus does because it's temporary and not real. Okay. And they've been mopping it up long term, like yep. a generation's been more. And this tightening will keep digging in and hitting harder over the next year. So we right. won't know where we're at until the summer or fall of 2024. And I'm saying we're going to be in maybe a depression, but at least a, a, a deep recession. By okay. So deep recession, if not depression. What is this other chart? This one says two tech cycles per 45 years and yep. one generational per 39. Is that yours? Yep. Explain most tops. Yep. Okay. Tell now us about this, this one, one real quick. Yep. I was known for the generational cycle. I came up with that myself. Nobody right. else. Okay. Yep. Enter the workforce at age 20, earn and spend more money to 46, 46 year lag, boom and bust. I can tell you the rest of our lives and our, and which countries around the world are going to boom and bust on that one simple indicator. So that's the generation impact. But the what I found not too far after that, technologies. I used to think they're on the same clock and they're both related to generation. No, the technology. So that generation cycle is about a 39 year cycle, 39 to 40. The technology cycles are 45 overall, but they also come in two waves. OK, so you get you get personal computers, then you get the Internet. Both of those were related. But boy, did the Internet expand what personal computers could do or what? OK, you get automobiles, then you get super highways. The super highways expand how fast and how far you can go in an automobile. Yes. And on and on and on. So okay. so the t- these two cycles I'm putting on one graph. G is the generational peaks, 1929, 1968. They'll go to the next. Here's the first G. Go over the second G in the middle of the graph. That's 1968. That was when the stock market adjusted for inflation peaked with the Bob Hope generation cycle. And then we had the baby boom cycle peak in 2007. Okay, and we see that over there, the last G up to the right side. And and look, but look, the stock market's gone up way up way since then, not because of the generational cycle, because of the stimulus and because the technology cycles are on a different clock. So again, we had the personal computer cycle, T1 on on the right side of the chart, just to look at only that. No, I'll go all the way over to more recent time. That peaked in 2000. Then T2 peaked in in, uh, 2021 recent. Okay. All right. So the recent cycle was technology still kicking hard, but the generation not. Into 2007, they were both doing well. Okay. All right. What about this one here? It says current Fed hike of 525 basis points, already the most since 1981, 550 basis points plus total. And then you've got some different time frames here. This is just to to emphasize, this is the biggest tightening we've had in modern history. Since they really started to use this, the people think, oh, they're not tightening hard enough. No, this was giant. Okay, it's already been giant. And now they're looking at even adding another 25 or 50 basis points because it doesn't seem to be working enough. Again, if you don't think in lags, you're going to get in trouble here. I'm saying they have already guaranteed a downturn next year with 525 basis points and very likely at least another quarter point. That's already going to hit. Harder I tell you, people. the vibe I get, not that I believe him, but Jerome Powell's taking a victory lap. He thinks he, he was bringing in the plane for a soft landing. I mean, you, you say that, wrong. You know what I'd say to Jerome Powell? You're an academic <laughs> douchebag and good luck. <laughs> on that. 
Do you know any major economist that's ever run a business, Jason? Have you ever met one? Yeah, yeah. How about Janet point. Yellen? She looks like she came out of a, a European nunnery. Look, she's a nice lady. She's smart. Yeah. She shouldn't be running our financial monetary policy around the world. Hey, at the time, at the know time, never run a business. When she when she was appointed Fed chair, everybody said she was the wealthiest Fed chair ever to be appointed at like a 13 million net worth or something like that, which you Still know, hasn't run really a business. Wealthy, but but yeah, so yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see. I, I don't know. It's interesting. Okay, what about this chart, Harry? Here's another one. This is uh, the okay. Russell 2000 this index. This is a topping pattern. I yeah. look at all the major markets and in the DAX in Germany and the FTSE in England, all these stuff in the UK and Japan. But in the United States, I'm focusing on the Russell 2000 because, first of all, when you first have a downturn, the small caps, which is what that is, tend to get hit harder and the large caps hold up better at first. But it's also because, and, and this, this is showing off a little funny on my screen, but this is showing a, a triangle pattern. Um, you know, first A top and then a B bottom, then a C top and then a D. And we just made this E top here recently at about 21,190 uh, or something like that on the Russell's thousand. And that's saying that's probably a final top and it'll be confirmed when we cross that bottom trend line around 1740 or so. And then it's going to keep falling. So this is what I'm saying. OK. Yes, we know that they push this back. Natural cycles, we would more likely expect to have a major correction on the decennial cycle, especially like from 2020 to 22. Well, no, they've stimulated. So it looks like to me, they pushed the whole cycle about two years, but this is my best gauge to say, okay, that's what I think's happening, but I'm gonna keep watching this gauge to prove it or not. And this Russell 2000, so I'm watching that to see if we break that bottom trend line. And if it does that, it's gonna be down another 20% overnight. And then people are gonna realize we're in a serious downturn and it's not a correction. Okay, so I think this might be your last slide you're sharing with us today. This is China's real estate crash keeps coming back. China's real estate returns to contraction mode. Property sector declined in a second quarter after short-lived improvement. What is this chart telling us? And, and why, well, again, why, you know, why is it important? In, in, in any bubble, when I look at the Roaring Twenties bubble, the la I mean, remember, bubbles are rare, first of all. So we haven't seen bubbles until recently. Ago. Okay. So we didn't start to see bubble activity till the mid-90s in stocks and in the early 2000s in housing, okay? And now mm -hmm. we've seen it ever since. So these bubbles build, and they eventually have to burst. And when they burst, they're already wor always worse than people think. And there's no way to stop a bubble from bursting once it goes too far and bursts enough, okay? My point is China is the lead bubble in the world. It may be the second largest economy adjusted for purchasing power. Actually, it has passed the United States on that for the first time. But still, the size of the economy, it hasn't been. It's been number two to the U.S., but it is way more leverage. It's growing from lower incomes to higher. And their government, I tell people, we print money. <laughs> they print condos. <laughs> they yeah. just build houses for nobody and say they well, print ghost cities. Yeah, that right. is that is way more leverage, way more stimulative sure. than just printing money. Because remember what I said earlier, even this five point two trillion that that'll wear off mostly in the next year or two. OK, well, these empty houses and you know how many empty houses there are in China right now? About twenty two percent. Wow. If we had twenty two percent empty houses in the U.S., we would be in a depression and, and, and real estate companies and, and builders would be mostly bankrupt. Yeah, we have the opposite problem. We have a shortage. OK, yeah, so we have a shortage because we got hit hard by 2008. Right. And builders have been very cautious since, yeah. which is going to work to their advantage. Well, but it's not just China, the builders, it's their, their you, lenders. You understand what's that, different about China other than they're new, wet behind the ears in the largest, fastest growing economy in the world. China's telling their developers, you build it and we'll cover your ass. Right. You just build it and we'll worry about it. Yeah. And that's what they've been doing. And that's the only way you get to 22% empty houses with no downturn. But now, now that China keeps slowing and is so overbuilt, then when they do go down, I'm saying China, we had the worst downturn in the Great Depression, although everybody went down because we had the most roaring 20s, okay? We were the China back then. We were the up and coming emerging country, quickly becoming a developed country. 
China is that today. And China's the biggest bubble, and, Ch and real estate was the biggest part of their bubble, and their real estate bubble is falling apart. And when their real estate, I don't care what happens to the rest of the world, China's real estate bubble falls apart and keeps falling apart, the rest of the world will follow because it'll change people's perception. People think real estate can never go down, and if so, not long. That is going to be proven wrong in yeah. the next decade. So if real estate goes down, you're talking about the price of real estate. Obviously, it's a credit-based asset, and it's been amazing how resilient it's been in the face of rates literally tripling. I mean, I, I can't believe- Because of a shortage of building by, by, by developers that got cream in 2008. Yeah, okay. yeah. So yeah. A, that was an overbuilding. Shortage of houses, a downturn can cure that overnight. What I'm saying is forget the United States. It's China that's the lead bubble here. China, the U.S. drew the world into the Great Depression, and then everybody followed for the same reasons. We were the lead and the most exaggerated bubble. China is the bubble to watch. Their real estate is the lead bubble, and it is falling apart from my point of view, and very likely will keep falling apart. And the more so, that so happens, Harry, the more Harry, everyone tell everyone in the world will say, Maybe you can go wrong buying real estate. Okay, okay, I got it, I got it. But let me ask you some questions here because I want we want to know why, right? So with because the US- doing, Because an everyday home was 100 grand 20 years ago, and now it's 400 grand when somebody's salary's maybe gone up 80%. That's why. Hang on a second. Hang, hang on, hang on, hang on. Okay, so, so look, in the United States, no one will disagree that we have a housing shortage right now. There's definitely a shortage of inventory. You're saying a downturn will cure that and it'll put a glut of inventory onto the market. But here's the thing, you have this problem and I call it the poison pill that the Fed put into the market during the COVID era, okay? And the poison pill is either a good pill or a poison pill, depending on which side of the equation you're on. If you want to buy a home, it's a poison pill because these people have 28 years left on their ultra cheap mortgages and there's this lock-in effect. It's like it's like having a job where you have the golden handcuffs in a corporate job, right? Where you just can't leave because the deal's too good of what's coming at you in the future. And so 25% of the country has a mortgage at or below 3%. 65% of the country has a mortgage at or below 4%. 42% of the country has no mortgage at all. Their homes are free and clear. And the one thing I always say, Harry, is that if you want to have a real estate crash, one ingredient that is like absolutely necessary is millions of distressed sellers. Without that, you can't have a crash. Am I wrong? Pick my theory apart. Tell me how, how wrong How about no buyers? What happened to buyers? Well, we already have no buyers. I mean, the demand has, has plummeted and still the market is not collapsing. I mean, demand demand was down as much as Okay, 30 well, let me give you another phrase, tipping point. Things have to go, this thing about fewer and fewer buyers and, I mean, and then, then no buyers, but people aren't, and I agree with it, people aren't selling because they can't afford to sell. They can't yeah, afford now to get a new mortgage at 7% instead of three and a half. They can't afford to pay rent. The house they have is such a good deal. You know what I liken it to, Harry? And, All you, you know, need, though, what happens when no new buyers, the young people aren't buying because the homes are too expensive? And more important, people see housing fall for the second. You have to realize, until housing fell 34%, between 2006 and 12, housing, even in the Great Depression, only fell 26%. Housing One happened. was the most stable asset, financial but, asset. But you have, to, you have to look at the order in which that happens. The seeing housing prices fall happen after no buyers. Okay, no buyers has to come first before the fall happens, right? And my argument is that this lock-in effect is so really toxic to the housing market in the sense of toxic, like no one's ever going to be able to buy a home because they're, no one's going to sell their house, right? The only, the only right, but, but, inventory but the only comes from new construction. Are buying. If nobody's ever going to buy again, no market. They may not go down as fast as they could, but no market's going to go up if there's not more buyers than sellers in the future. Who's going to buy these houses? Right. They're way overpriced. And <laughs> Got it. I agree that affordability sucks. I totally agree with you. And the for the first is nobody's time, history, selling. people saw houses, especially high-end homes, go down 60% or more, and everyday homes go down 30% or more. 
People didn't even think that was possible until like, then, Jay. We're, we're not talking about that. We're talking about what's happened now. We've got all these people with these ultra cheap mortgages or no mortgage. Right. So they sit and do nothing. Yeah. Is the economy going to grow if all of your people, I'm not saying they're going to sell. Yeah. You're right. They can't afford to sell yeah. unless home prices come down enough. And then maybe they're, yeah. I'm not worried about them. They're not going to cause us. You're just going to lose new buyers and no market can go up without new buyers. So let's talk about new buyers for a second. So I think what happens is that, you know, a lot of people make this kind of mistake where they think that they say, okay, housing affordability is a 37 year low, which it is right right now, literally, it's terrible. Okay. And they say, well, how is the market going to work if nobody can afford a house? Well, it's not that nobody can afford a house. It's just that their expectations are higher than reality because reality declined. And so they have to capitulate and adjust their expectations downward. And I give the example of where I was born. I was born in Europe and in Europe, I, I couldn't stand in 2008 when Obama was kept saying we should be more like Europe. I mean, in Europe, people live in crappy little houses. Oh. They drive crappy oh, little wow. cars. Their yeah. standard of living is dramatically lower than the U.S., right? Yeah. But it's supposed to be so great. And, and you, I just and got back from it, five weeks in you Europe. You don't see it in food and everything. You see it, just like you said, in houses and cars. Right. Our houses so, and our cars are bigger and more. Of course they are. And that's great because we have a higher standard of living by a yeah. long shot. But what I'm saying is people just have to accept less that's just reality everybody goes into the marketplace as a you know well, a semi-rational actor bricks and plywood that builders are building they're building smaller houses yeah they're just going to take a smaller that's house in a lesser neighborhood developers. with less no lesser new buyers and yeah. smaller houses because nobody can afford the big one yeah that's how, how do you interpret that as bullish for for builders long term it, it's it's not bullish what i'm my argument is the standard of living is declining period yeah. That's it. And That's why what would the economy does. keep going up if the standard of living is declining? People feel poor. They spend less on what they, especially housing crowds out other things. If you got to spend that much to buy your first house for your kids to get them in a good school district, yeah. well, then you can't afford that BMW. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Or, or the better stakes or whatever. Totally agree. Totally agree. So, totally agree. And but but then you ask yourself, what happens to all these would be home buyers that can't buy or don't buy because they won't make the compromise? Well, they have to just rent. And so, you know, that puts upward pressure on rents. I mean, look, it seems like the whole discussion really needs to be much more focused on and not many pundits focus on this. They need to focus on demographics and population size, household formation versus household inventory. That's the discussion, in my opinion. It's not about what rates do or what prices do as much as it is about that simple thing of supply and demand. Okay, well, let, let's take one more step up. The most sure. important number to me in the world is workforce. You got yeah. older people that aren't doing much and taking right. more than they give. You got young people that take everything and do nothing yeah. but cause trouble for a living, okay? So they do. So it's workforce. <laughs> you know my projections for workforce growth in Europe and the United States are over the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years? Zero. Yeah. It's pretty much zero. How do you grow when your our workforce has always grown and it's grown actually pretty dramatically at times? We have the workforce is the most important. There's peak spending is one thing, but just work for it. People that are working versus not. Okay. If your working group is flat or becoming the same or smaller percentage of the economy, you're not going to grow as fast in the future. That's not a good indicator. And, and this could lead and us that's the down. Indicator in the whole developed world and in the two worst parts of the developed world, which people aren't looking at enough, who are going to die, literally die before our eyes in the next three decades, are Southern Europe and East Asia. Yeah. South Korea, Japan, and China. Yeah, well, and chi China's got a demographic disaster on their hands. Demographic Japan does, disaster. Russia does, Western Europe does. I mean, it's just a disaster. So that's a good question of compared to what, right? Like the whole world has all of these problems, but I say that the US is dramatically better off, even though it's in decline for sure, uh, than the others. The, yeah, uh, let, me give me, let me give an even better example of that. In China, over the next 50 years, they're going to they're peaking here at 1.4 billion people. OK, yep. they are going to drop in the next 50 years to 780. I know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's that Japan. It's East Asia is the fastest aging because more than anybody on Earth, for some reason, I don't understand, Jason, when 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 Asians get affluent, they have even fewer kids. 
Yeah. Their goal, once they once they start to get affluent, they want all they want their kids in Harvard and Stanford. OK, so they're going to have one or two kids even more so than U.S. or Europeans. So they really get hit by by one of the worst challenges in economics. The more affluent you get, the fewer kids we have. Yeah. That is that is the worst thing. That's the biggest reason developed countries are slowing all the way around the world and will for as far as the eye can see. No and why not. I'm not bullish. I don't care if these people don't sell their damn houses, Jason. There's yeah. not going to be new young people to follow them and buy them when they die and they do sell them. They'll sell so, them when they die. The the things I'm going to be dead in 16 I, years, I predict. So I, I'm going to be a seller. I, I got to wrap up, but I would love to talk to you sometime about the impact of technology and artificial intelligence, because you talked about how the labor force isn't growing in the future. And, you know, maybe it kind of doesn't need to because of that. I don't know. It's a complicated. Yeah, no, last uh, thing I worry about, technology has yeah. always made us richer and expanded. Yeah. We've never had less jobs because expanding technology ever. Right. Yep. I agree. That's I agree. The, the sewing machine, the steam engine, the cotton gin all just made more employment. Because yeah. they create better ones every time over time. I know. And that's that's a positive thing. And then the other issue is, and no one's talking about this, is the transfer of wealth that happens as baby boomers die off and silent generation people die off, the transfer to the millennial generation and Gen X to an extent as well. So these are topics we got to talk about another time. But Harry, Key word there being you, transfer. It's not new wealth. It's just transferring from one to the other. It's not a net increase in wealth. I understand that. But when they inherit that wealth, they're going to go out and spend it more so than their more conservative parents, yeah. Yeah. in my opinion. Okay. No question. And, yeah. But that's happened with every generation. And that's yeah. stimulative. So always, that's and they stimulative, don't inherit, Jason, people think they're inheriting this wealth in their 30s and 40s. No, yeah. they're getting it in their 50s and 60s yeah. when their parents are dying in their 80s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Right, 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 right. Okay. That, is, but that, that is a good thing for the young people, but it's not a net increase for the economy. No, and, but it is and more it's spending. not going to people that are in a rising spending cycle, which people would think it is. Yeah. More spending than their parents. That's all. I'm yes, not saying it's but not a huge thing in their yeah. own career. Yeah, You're right. yeah got it. Got More it. than their okay. parents, for sure. Harry, the final question I got to wrap up is what should we do? Leave us with some action steps. This is like a data dump. There's just too much here. People want to know what to do. What do I do? You're probably going to say, you know, buy gold or something. I don't know what you're no. going to say. Tell us what's, what's, this, what's the action step. Okay. Number one, and this is a short term thing. People think I'm recommending this long term. The highest quality 10 and 30 year treasury bonds, ETFs like TLT and ZMF, which is triple, ZROS, which is like one and a half, they're 25 year. It is the long term highest quality bonds, which no matter how much debt we have, we're still the best house in a bad neighborhood, demographics, debt ratios, everything compared to the other developed countries. Our bonds will be the safe haven when, when real estate and stocks all crash together and way more than anybody thinks much as we saw in 2008. In fact, I give you a number on that, Jason, 1.5x. Whatever the stock market went down then, 1.5x. Whatever real estate, 34% went down then, 1.5x will be 50%, okay? So right. the same thing happens, okay? So, so that's the thing, these financial assets go down and that is a good thing long-term for who? The millennials, the younger generation who can't afford to buy that house today, but if it went down 50%, They'd be jump. Their baby boomer parents are going to be. Oh my God, we can't afford to retire now. They're going to be jumping up and down. Damn, we can afford to buy a house we're proud of for the first time. Okay, life. so the answer is the action step is buy bonds. Yeah, well, buy the this for only for the downturn. I Certain think times. the end of next year is a rough thing right now. Okay, you buy the highest quality treasury bonds. So if you had to just buy an ETF, TLT. Is the most okay. liquid large one. Anything market. else? Is there another step besides buy TLT? Well, the other thing is you short stocks. Now, well, first of all, you got to get out of stocks and real estate. If your kids just, you know, bought a low end home, they're not as exposed as if you just bought a high end home or you bought in a retirement area or something like that. But, but basically, you get out of real estate, especially if you have two homes, sell the vacation home and keep your primary home. Or if you have a five bedroom home, you no longer need sell that and downsize to a three bedroom home. The problem is you got to take a mortgage that's three times the rate. Well, it, well and, and in that case, I agree with you on that. Yeah. I would say sell the home today, the five bedroom, wait two years and buy that two, that's trade. Until down. the Fed pivot happens. Wait until interest rates are lower and home prices are down. Yeah. 
Interesting. Good stuff. Harry Dent, it's always great to talk to you. And what a rant that was. Uh, <laughs> HarryDent.com. I've got a free newsletter. Yeah. Both my, you know, Rodney Johnson, he's a bright guy. Yeah. We both prob- give a free article every week for free to people to sign up to get to know us. So you go to HarryDent.com, get on our free newsletter. Then you can decide if we're smart enough to pay a little money for a real newsletter. HarryDent.com. And of course, check out Harry's books on all the usual places. They're great. And Harry, thanks again for joining us. It's always good to talk to you, buddy. 